at SFA. We are glad that you have joined us for what promises to be a very informative session. Before we begin, I'd like to briefly go over the format and logistical details of this web webinar. I will be serving as the moderator for today's session. We have four panelists who will give a brief background on sarcoma and the role of radiation therapy in sarcoma treatment. This will be followed by highlights of the recently released ASTRO guidelines. After that, they will look at radiation therapy first from the perspective of a surgical oncologist and then from a medical oncologist. After their presentations, we will have a questions and answers session. I will ask the panelists questions submitted by participants. At any time during today's session, you can submit your questions by entering them in the questions field. Our panelists will not be able to answer questions related to your specific medical situation, so please make sure that they are related to topics raised during the session. The information contained in this webinar is intended to be for educational and informational purposes only. It is not a substitute for medical advice from your physician about your specific situation. Today's session is being recorded. The discussion will be archived and a link will be posted to SFA's website. Lastly, as a reminder, all participant, participants are muted and any questions or comments can be submitted through the webinar's question portal. An important part of our mission at the Sarcoma Foundation of America is to provide educational opportunities to help empower the sarcoma community. In this session, we will want to give you an overview of radiation therapy and sarcoma treatment. The expert panelists with us today will provide a review of background and methods of radiation treatment, an update on changes in the ASTRO guidelines, and the importance and role of the multidisciplinary team. As mentioned, our panelists will also spend time answering any questions you have in regard to the information presented during the session. So please be sure to submit questions through the portal. Now I would like to introduce our panel members. Dr. Mina Betty received her medical doctorate at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. She then completed an internship in medicine at St. Louis University Hospitals in St. Louis, Missouri. She then completed a residency in radiation oncology at the Medical College of Wisconsin. She is currently the Sharon K. Wadena Endowed Chair in Sarcoma Research and Associate Professor of Radiation Oncology, General Surgery, Orthopedic Surgery, and Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences at the Medical College of Wisconsin. Dr. Betty specializes in treating sarcomas as well as gynecological and genitourinary cancers. Dr. Ashley Guadanala, Guadanala received her medical doctorate from Harvard Medical School and Masters of Public Health at Harvard School of Public Health. Dr. Guadanala is, uh, completed her residency and chief residency at Harvard's Joint Center for Radiation Therapy. She is a professor and section chief of the Sarcoma Melanoma Radiation Oncology Section and holds a dual appointment in the Department of Health Services Research. She clinically specializes in rare tumors, including bone and soft tissue sarcoma, and melanoma and non-melanoma skin malignancies, and has published numerous clinical studies investigating radiotherapeutic management of these tumors. She is a fellow of the American Society of Radiation Oncology and recently chaired the committee that produced ASTRO's first clinical practice guideline regarding use of radiation therapy for management of soft tissue sarcoma in adults. Dr. Jason Siklik earned his medical degree from UCLA David Geffen School of Medicine. He then completed a fellowship in surgical oncology at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. He completed a general surgery residency at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. He is board certified in general surgery and a fellow of the American College of Surgeons. Dr. Siklik specializes in treating hepatobiliary diseases and sarcomas, including gastrointestinal stromal tumors. He has a special interest in abdominal and retroperitoneal sarcomas, primary liver tumors, and colorectal and neuroendocrine cancers that have metastasized to the liver. Dr. Jonathan Trent earned his MD and PhD in cancer biology from the University of Texas Health Science Center, where he also completed a residency in internal medicine. 
He then completed a fellowship in medical oncology at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center while serving as chief fellow. Dr. Trent is currently the associate director for clinical research, the director of the bone and soft tissue sarcoma group at the Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center. Dr. Trent's interests are in the clinical and translational research of sarcomas, direct care of sarcoma patients, and education about sarcoma. An associate as Associate Director for Clinical Research, his goal is to help Sylvester faculty develop clinical trials that provide clinically effective and scientifically exciting therapy to cancer patients of South Florida and beyond. Again, thank you to all the panelists for joining us today. I will now hand it off to Dr. Betty, who will provide the first presentation today. Dr. Betty. Thank you. Um, so uh, thank you for all participating in the Sarcoma Foundation of America webinar. My name is Mina Beatty. I'm a radiation oncologist at the Medical College of Wisconsin, and I'm honored to be able to present today um, on the role of radiation therapy in the management of soft tissue sarcomas. I have no disclosures. So um, briefly, I'm gonna go over some background on soft tissue sarcomas and then delve into the management um, and how the management has changed over the last several decades, particularly in regards to radiation and surgery. So I um, start all my sarcoma talks the same way. I say that sarcomas are rare. They comprise of 1% of all adult malignancies and 15 to 20% of all pediatric malignancies. They're heterogeneous. Um, they are certainly over 50 subtypes, and depending on the subtype, management can vary. And um, they arise from the mesenchyme of the mesoderm embryologically. So depending on the structure, it arises from, uh, gives rise to the uh, subtype of sarcoma. So if it arises from the smooth muscle, it's a leiomyosarcoma, skeletal muscle, rhabdomyosarcoma, so on and so forth. Sarcomas. Sorry, this is picky. Um, sarcomas uh, typically occur in the extremity, uh, most commonly in the lower extremity. And uh, risk factors for sarcoma, usually patients will have just a sporadic reason or a sporadic etiology for development of their sarcoma or uh, mutation. Um, genetic alterations can occur. We've seen patients who presented with um, uh, genetic alterations that predispose them to sarcomas or other types of malignancies. Radiation associated sarcomas can happen many years down the line after uh, treatment of ra with radiation. Environmental and comorbid factors can also lead to sarcoma, more rare um, and much more rare than that are uh, burns, scars, other trauma that um, can lead to sarcomas. There are certain sarcomas that uh, are have a specific pathologic signature. So if you look at the depiction on the right, um, we all have 23 pairs of chromosomes within our body, and uh, translocation occurs when two pieces of a, a chromosome, uh, one from uh, two different types of chromosome or two different numbers of chromosomes, they exchange parts. And depending on the number and the type of um, translocation or type of exchange, that can give rise to a particular type of sarcoma, which is um, seen on the left. Most sarcomas present as painless masses. Um, I've had patients who've come to me and say, you know, I, I noticed some trauma or I, had, I, I fell and I noticed this, I thought I strained my muscle or I thought it was a hematoma. In the abdominal or retroperitoneal setting, um, patients will often present with bloating, uh, early satiety, alteration of their bowel or bladder habits. Um, the most common thing I'll have patients tell me, uh, you know, I was trying to lose weight. I had modified my diet and exercise, but just couldn't, couldn't get rid of the weight. Uh, rarely do they present with any obstructive symptoms. And if they were to have pain, it's usually back pain. So the most important thing is when you notice a mass, it's um, to image uh, prior to any type of intervention or biopsy. Um, and that includes an MRI, uh, CAT scan, uh, x-rays. And once you see this or identify this mass on imaging, a biopsy can then be carefully planned and should be done by either a surgical or musculoskeletal oncologist or musculoskeletal radiologist who has training and access to these, uh, these tumors. 
Uh, once pathology has been confirmed, additional imaging can be obtained, such as a CAT scan, MRI, PET scan. And once all of the imaging is obtained, that stage it typically stages a patient. Um, the new staging system as of 2018, um, really what is the most important thing in terms of stage or size um, spread beyond the primary tumor and grade. So the management of extremity sarcomas has definitely evolved over the past several years. Um, and what I would say is what has not evolved is um, the multidisciplinary interaction that's remained, uh, remained constant. That's very important in terms of the management of sarcomas. Uh, having this tumor board discussion with a surgical or orthopedic oncologist, um, radiation oncologist, medical oncologist, radiologist, pathologist, that's all very important from the time of diagnosis to throughout the treatment and after. Um, and that's not only detailed in NCCN guidelines, it's also shown. Um, um, so that's also shown in NCC and guidelines, but also um, what's detailed in the literature is that um, outcomes can be uh, dependent on where patients are seen and how, um, how much expertise a center has. So this was another study. It was a 2018 study that looked at, um, sorry, <laughs> patients with um, um, sarcoma at high volume centers in the National Cancer Center database analysis, over 7,000 cases of sarcoma were diagnosed or were looked at and high volume centers were delineated as those that um, had uh, saw at least 10 cases per year. And if patients were seen at these high volume centers, they had improvement in their two, five and 10 year outcomes. So it's, it um, doesn't really matter, you know, where the patient is uh, seen, what part of the country, as long as they have the expertise, how a high, they see a high volume of patients each year um, and, um, you know, have this multidisciplinary group of individuals that we discussed, that's the most important thing in terms of management um, and uh, certainly can impact outcomes. Um, Uh, so the surgery uh, has definitely evolved. As I mentioned, all aspects of sarcoma uh, management have evolved. Uh, perhaps the most impactful um, change was uh, going away from amputation more towards uh, multi multimodality therapy. Um, I'm not sure who's, who's uh, advancing the slides, if it's me or somebody else, but. It's um, you advance them. It's me, yeah, it's not advancing when I move it, the arrow, sorry. There you go, there you go. Um, so as I mentioned, surgery is the mainstay of treatment for sar many sarcomas and most sarcomas. Um, amputation is certainly uh, morbid and has a lot of morbidity. Um, and this was a landmark study that was done in 1982, it was an NCI study. And it's a study I would say would probably could never be done today, but um, it took patients with extremity, high grade soft tissue sarcomas and randomize them to amputation or wide local excision and post-operative radiation um, with post-op chemo given. Um, and what it showed was there's no difference in local failure, disease-free survival or overall survival. So that study was really um, impactful in terms of um, the evolution of management of, of these soft tissue sarcomas. Sorry, I keep trying to advance, it's not advancing. Okay, so as I mentioned, um, that study showed that, you know, really we don't need to have amputation, but it also showed that uh, radiation therapy is very important um, in terms of the localized management of soft tissue sarcomas. That study, um, along with many other studies, have looked at postoperative radiation therapy and soft tissue sarcomas. Um, if this slide advances, uh, yeah, this is an NCI study. It's another NCI study. Many of the studies come from, uh, from the NCI. Um, it looked at both high and low grade soft tissue sarcomas, over 140 patients. Um, and uh, patients were randomized to, uh, depending on what grade they presented with. So if they were high grade, they received postoperative radiation with chemo versus chemo alone, low grade postoperative radiation alone versus observation. And um, this follow-up was a 20 year follow-up 
And compared to surgery alone, multimodality therapy with surgery, radiation, uh, with or without chemotherapy, led to an improvement in local control, 10-year and 20-year uh, overall survival. Um, so, as I said, there have been these studies as well as many other studies that looked at the importance of postoperative radiation. Um, but what about preoperative radiation? Uh, there are certain advantages that uh, with preoperative radiation, um, we deliver a lower radiation dose, we can see the tumor, so we have smaller treatment volumes, um, we hopefully facilitate margin negative resection. Uh, theoretically, when we have a intact oxygen supply, um, radiation needs oxygen to create free radicals for tumor kill. So when we when that's not disrupted, that theoretically improves our ability um, to deliver the radiation and for tumor kill. And then certainly less long-term toxicity with fibrosis and uh, joint stiffness can be seen with uh, preoperative radiation. So this is another study, it was out of the NCI, it was an NCI can Canadian study, uh, that one of the first ones that compared pre-op versus post-operative radiation, if not the first one. Um, 190 patients were accrued um, this, with extremity soft tissue sarcomas, and they were randomized to preoperative radiation for five weeks or post-operative radiation for six to seven weeks, and a boost could be delivered if they had positive margins. And although wound complications were higher in the preoperative arm, 35% um, versus 17%, there was no difference in local recurrence or distant metastasis, and there was an improvement actually in survival. After two and a half years, there was an improvement in survival. It was not power for our survival analysis, but um, it did show a benefit. Um, and this, among other, this led to the development of other studies that looked at preoperative radiation that showed excellent rates of local control and survival. And so, just like the postoperative data. Um, emerged originally uh, looking at the benefit of postoperative radiation. Uh, there have been um, recently many studies that look at uh, preoperative radiation that's shown the benefit. Sorry, I think, yeah, there you go. Thanks. So we just talked about the evolution of management and uh, radiation therapy from a uh, surgery perspective, probably the biggest evolution or change has been from amputation to limb sparing surgery. Radiation, um, from no radiation to postoperative radiation to preoperative radiation. There are some centers that um, just perform preoperative radiation. I, I belong to one of those centers. Uh, there are certainly advantages and disadvantages of preoperative radiation, preoperative and postoperative radiation. Um, the implementation of radiation and retroperitoneal sarcomas that has evolved over time, um, and then. Systemic therapy has also evolved, and I'll let uh, my uh, colleagues in, uh, in general in the surgery, in surgical oncology, and uh, medical oncology uh, detail further. But uh, one thing I wanted to note is that all sarcoma providers, we all use uh, resources um, in our daily practice to manage uh, patients. And uh, NCCN guidelines is, a, is a, a valuable resource for us that, that if you look at the guidelines from 10 years ago, that's certainly changed. Um, that's certainly different from what it is was, is today. Um, we rely on our publications and contouring atlases and, and radiation per, uh, especially. And then um, uh, the 2021 Astro Consensus Guidelines just came out and were presented at our national meeting. It was spearheaded by Dr. Salerno and Dr. Guadagnolo. Um, and I will uh, turn it over to Dr. Guadagnolo to discuss uh, the Astro Consensus Guidelines and how radiation is used in the modern day era and the management of soft tissue sarcomas. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Beatty. So I'm Ashley Guadagnola. I am uh, a professor and the section chief of uh, sarcoma melanoma radiation oncology at MD Anderson. Uh, and in the interest of time, I'm going to give uh, generally a high level guideline, uh, a high level summary of the ASTRO clinical practice guideline. It's the first ever guideline for the treatment of soft tissue sarcoma in adults. Next slide. Um, I have no conflicts. I have a grant that is unrelated to this work. Next slide. So it's an honor and a privilege to be here, and I hope everybody is uh, having a much better year. I'm about, I'm about at a level two, uh, but over the course of the pandemic, we were able to put out this guideline. If you can have the next slide, please. Um, the Astro site uh, specifically uh, has slides that you can look at. Um, it's worth noting that the guideline was developed in collaboration with the American Society for Clinical Oncology. 
the Musculoskeletal Tumor Society, and the Society of Surgical Oncology. Furthermore, it was endorsed by the Canadian Association of Radiation Oncology, the European Society for Radiotherapy and Oncology, Musculoskeletal Tumor Society, the Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Radiologists, and the Society of Surgical Oncology. Next slide, please. Um, the guideline task force is listed here. You can see the full roster on the, on the site. Um, and it's worth noting that Dr. Betty and Dr. Trent, uh, if you'll advance, then there'll be a, an animation. Uh, both, of, uh, uh, both of the two presenters here also uh, contributed to the guideline, but it was, a, it was a group effort for sure. The full citation is available on PubMed and was published in Practical Radiation Oncology in the September, October, 2021 issue. And you can actually go to the ASTRO website and actually read the full uh, guideline there, including all of the appendices. Next slide. The task force composition specifically included radiation oncologists, of course, uh, but it also included residents, medical, orthopedic, and surgical oncologists, a medical physicist, a pathologist with specific sarcoma expertise, uh, and a patient representative, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. Next slide. The guideline scope was to provide recommendations on the role of radiation for adult patients with primary operable localized soft tissue sarcoma of the extremity and trunk, that's key questions one through four, as well as for retroperitoneal sarcoma, which was specifically addressed in key question five. The guideline discusses indications, doses, techniques, and treatment planning recommendations. Next slide. The guideline was formed via a systematic review, which included an extensive literature search of over 900 articles, of which eventually 110 articles were included and detailed abstraction was performed into evidence tables. Uh, we, spe we, we specified outcomes specifically regarding local control, overall survival, acute and late toxicity, including wound complications arising from surgery. Again, this was adult soft tissue sarcoma, we did not address pediatric patients, unresectable uh, sarcomas, metastatic disease, uh, palliative radiotherapy, and we did not take up systemic therapy specifically because we thought that was more the purview of ASCO. Next slide. I'm not going to read all of this, but basically this is to say that there was a specific guideline methodology. It was a Delphi approach. It was an expert uh, voting mechanism where it was a Likert type scale where we analyzed the evidence and came up with language for the recommendation. And it was, so this wasn't, uh, you know, someone's opinion or someone by themselves sort of coming up with something. This was truly a continual consensus process. And the details of the guidelines, uh, uh, the guideline process are available on the ASTRO website. Next slide. So we'll get into the key questions. Uh, key question one uh, has five sub recommendations. I'm not gonna read them to you, but generally it addressed the roles and indication for radiotherapy. Uh, and each three of the key questions starts with the importance, the strong recommendation that all patients undergo multidisciplinary evaluation uh, by all disciplines, including expert sarcoma pathology and musculoskeletal radiology. And that was a strong recommendation throughout. Uh, the other key recommendation from this key question uh, was that for patients with primary localized extremity and truncal soft tissue sarcoma for whom an oncologic resection is planned, radiation is recommended for those at risk for local recurrence. And if you could advance, you'll see the, the box to show up. And it, there's extensive text in the guideline for you to reference that talks about what goes into increased risk for local recurrence. There's not, quite frankly, a true algorithmic way to you know, say what is high risk. It's multifactorial and includes things like size, grade, anatomic location, margins are extremely important, surgical resection margins, and the potential morbidity of future salvage surgery or salvage options should someone recur with their sarcoma. So all of these things played into deciding who may benefit from radiation therapy. Next slide. Key question two actually has six sub recommendations, but generally it was about the appropriate considerations used in determining whether radiation should be used prior to surgery or whether it should be used after surgery. Again, that needs to undergo a multidisciplinary review in determining what would offer the optimal outcomes with the patient and likely needs to include patient preferences as well. And if you could advance, you'll see the key box that arises. So the, the main uh, key point here is that we wanted to codify and formalize the idea that for patients with sarcoma who are undergo surgery and radiation therapy, that preoperative radiotherapy is recommended over postoperative radiotherapy, except for in select cases. And that was a strong recommendation with moderate quality of evidence to support it. Next slide. 
So you may be wondering, what, have, what about patients who have an unplanned excision? So this is patients for which a sarcoma was not suspected when they had a surgery. And so they had, I think the term sometimes you may see is a shell out or a non-oncologic surgery. And so this is a busy a little algorithm, but there are two of them in there. But basically this helps guide and it incorporates the recommendations from key question one and key question two and how to think about proceeding for patients who, un who undergo an unplanned excision. And generally, of course, it starts with multidisciplinary evaluation and then the assessment of whether or not further surgery can be done. And then if radiation and surgery are recommended, it gives a consideration algorithm for how to determine what is the best sequencing with multidisciplinary input. Next slide. Key question three uh, goes through the appropriate dose and fractionation regimens for both preoperative and postoperative radiotherapy. And additionally, it provides some detailed recommendations regarding target volumes. Generally, for patients with primary localized extremity and truncal soft tissue sarcoma who are receiving preoperative radiotherapy, the, the data su supports a strong recommendation for the standard use of 5,000 centigrade and 25 daily fractions. So this is five weeks. Furthermore, for patients who are receiving post-operative radiotherapy, it talks about giving radiotherapy to 5,000 centigrade and 25 once daily fractions to a clinical target volume, uh, then a sub-volume that is a reduced volumetric volume receives an additional 1,000 to 1,600 centigrade, depending on the margin status and the discretion of the treating radiation oncologist. Both of these recommendations were strong recommendations, and there is a detailed discussion about dose and considerations in the text of the guideline. Next slide. The, uh, the guideline does give details about clinical target recommendations. I'm not gonna read this to you, but I would direct your attention if you have further interest to refer to table six, uh, which gives a quite detailed breakdown of the ways to construct clinical target volumes for radiotherapy planning. If you'll advance, you'll see the key uh, additional point here uh, for, uh, Patients with sarcoma, elective nodal radiation is not recommended. So uh, it, there is a discussion of this, but there was a strong recommendation and moderate data to support it that we don't electively target lymph nodes, meaning we don't radi irradiate the lymph nodes if they're not involved. Next slide. Key questions three and four, uh, again, further go into uh, detailed target volumes. And then key question four specifically uh, takes up recommendations regarding simulation techniques, image guidance recommendations, specifically whether daily imaging should be used, uh, CT versus KV imaging, the different techniques that you can use, and commenting on the use of devices that help, uh, that help shape the radiation dose around the skin, which is called bolus. Next slide. Key question five, this is the, the, the uh, key question that took up discussing the role of radiotherapy in the treatment of retroperitoneal sarcoma, including the preferred dose regimens and treatment planning considerations for patients who may receive radiotherapy for that diagnosis. There are nine sub recommendations uh, in, in this key question. And if you'll advance the slide, I can point you to the key one. So, there was there were new randomized data this year for this uh, for this this presentation of soft tissue sarcoma, but we took the totality of the evidence and there there was a conditional recommendation that the routine use of radiotherapy in addition to surgery for patients with retroperitoneal sarcoma is conditionally not recommended. However, given uh, the uh, vast sort of historical evidence and and in a practice of giving radiotherapy for some select patients, we did feel that there was moderate evidence to support selective use of radiotherapy for some patients who are at high risk of local recurrence. If you could advance, please. We noted that if radiotherapy is planned in addition to oncologic resection for retroperitoneal sarcoma, that preoperative radiotherapy is recommended, and the dosing that is recommended is the 5,000 centigrade and 25 fractions, or 5,040 centigrade and 28 once daily fractions. Advance, please. We did discuss additional recommendations and, uh, and the data regarding dosing and radiotherapy delivery for retroperitoneal sarcoma. It's important to note that of all the studies for this, uh, this tumor type, most show that postoperative radiotherapy is associated with an unacceptably high rate of complications given the higher dose needed to treat this sarcoma after surgery. 
Therefore, a strong recommendation was made that generally post-operative radiotherapy for retroperitoneal sarcoma is not recommended. Again, we provided a detailed table of recommended target volumes, and it is included in the guideline. Next slide. Importantly, uh, we had a patient provide uh, patient reflections and provide our recommendations from a patient perspective. Uh, she recommended that physicians treating patients with sarcoma importantly do not make assumptions about patients, what's important to them, what their uh, life plans may be with respect to side effects and, and, and how they might prioritize outcomes. Uh, she encouraged physicians to ask, listen, and be mindful of the words used and to understand that patients may not understand all of the terms that we throw around, especially of trainees and uh, uh, physician assistants and people are coming in and out of the room to help care for the patients, as many times they are in large academic centers. She wanted us to know that second opinions are friends, not foes. Uh, she said that patients uh, often feel like they're completely out of control when they have a cancer diagnosis and that a second opinion can provide a patient a way to just get a second view of things and help them feel like they're slightly in control of the decision making during uh, this obviously very uh, frightening uh, treatment process for many patients. Um, she encouraged patients to reach out to get support from family, friends. She specifically recommended that uh, patients uh, who have this diagnosis consider a psycho-oncology consult. She said she found that personally very helpful. And she said there are many helpful online and peer mentoring resources. Uh, I would direct you to Appendix 4 of the full guideline on the ASTRO website where she provided uh, a, a full written set of recommendations uh, for both providers and patients. Next slide. In conclusion, uh, key points to remember is that a multidisciplinary evaluation and discussion prior to the initiation of treatment were recommended and de deemed critical for determining optical, optical management throughout the, the guideline. And this is for soft tissue sarcomas of any site. There was note that made that the addition of radiotherapy to resection improves local control as well as function preservation and is indicated for patients with high risk of, risk of local recurrence. The guideline recommended that when radiation therapy is indicated, preoperative radiotherapy is preferred over postoperative radiotherapy except in select circumstances, and those are detailed in the guideline. The guideline recommended that modern treatment planning techniques for soft tissue sarcoma have improved outcomes and includes uh, updated recommendations regarding volume definition, advanced delivery techniques, and daily image guidance. Finally, the current guideline uh, rec uh, recommends that the current evidence does not support routine use of radiotherapy in addition to surgery for retroperitoneal sarcoma, but preoperative radiotherapy may be beneficial in select cases. Next slide. Uh, I would like to note that the guideline would not be possible without the ASTRO staff who were uh, assigned, Lisa Bradfield and Rachel McCausland. We had uh, an excellent medical librarian, Yiming Ging. We had a whole posse of residents who helped us uh, pull the literature and abstract it. And the guideline was made infinitely better by the peer review comments by many of our peer reviewers who combed it before it was released. Thank you. I'll turn it over to Dr. Sicklick. Well, good afternoon and good evening. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to present today. Um, next, next slide. So I'll be um, discussing radiation therapy from the surgical oncology perspective. Um, there'll be a lot of overlap between uh, the prior to um, presentations with um, some, some subtle um, nuances from a surgical perspective. Next. These are my disclosures, although none of them are necessarily relevant to what we'll be discussing today. Next. Next. So sarcomas uh, occur throughout the body. Um, we know that they can occur in the head and neck, the truncal region of the chest and abdominal wall, as well as the extremities, including the, both the arms and legs. Next. Next. As you heard, you can also get uh, sarcomas in the abdomen and then the retroperitoneum, which is the area behind the, the intestines, sort of around the kidneys um, in the backside of the abdomen. Next. So sarcoma care is very complex as you're, as you're hearing, and it's truly sarcoma surgery is a team sport. It really, it's all evolves around the patient, 
Um, it includes um, obviously surgical oncology, but also surgical subspecialties next. which includes everything from orthopedic surgery to spine surgeons, whether they be orthopedic or neurosurgeons, head and neck surgeons, thoracic surgeons, GI and oncologists, urologists, vascular surgeons, as well as plastic and reconstructive surgeons. And all these individuals are working together centered around the patient to optimize therapy. Now, surgical therapy for, for sarcomas is really trying to balance treating the cancer with maintaining function. These are just a couple examples of, of extremity sarcomas here. One of the uh, right arm, as you can see there, is a large mass right at the elbow, and then another one of the uh, left thigh. Next. So as a sarcoma surgeon, there's really three main aims that I have. One being following oncologic principles, meaning that if there was a biopsy done, we're gonna try to resect the site um, of the um, biopsy with the tumor itself. We're gonna to try to dissect into normal tissue planes, meaning that we're not trying to dissect into the tumor itself because we don't wanna quote unquote contaminate that, that area. But we don't need to take out the entire area or the entire compartment, if you will, of where the tumor is. So we're trying to get the tumor out, but we're not going you know, above and beyond taking out significantly more um, tissue just to say that we took it out. At the same time, we're trying to preserve critical structures, whether they be nerves, blood vessels, bones, or joints. You know, and ultimately, in the end, the goal of this is to maintain function. Next. So in terms of obtaining resection margins, we're, we're basically, we talk about the surgical margins and the pathologic margins, and you've already heard how important it is to have a sarcoma pathologist um, that's familiar with the diseases that can be part of the uh, team. As a surgeon, um, um, there are th basically three different types of margins that can occur. Our aim is to have what we call R0 resection, meaning that there's no residual microscopic disease at the margin. And R1 resection is what we term when there's microscopic residual disease, meaning that as a, as, with grossly to our eyes, we took the whole tumor out with what looked like grossly clear margins, However, under the microscope, the pathologist notes that there's cells, um, there's tumor cells at the margin. And then the last one, which is the worst case scenario, which we don't want to occur, but certainly does occur, and as you sort of heard about, um, and you saw in one of the panels um, showing sort of what other, what we can consider is um, resection is an R2 resection is when there's gross residual disease left. This is obviously not the aim of, of an operation unless it's done um, inadvertently at the time trying to resect what is not thought to be a, a sarcoma. Now, as a surgeon, when we're trying to, when we're thinking about you know, our radiation colleagues and what's gonna be best for the patient, one of the things that uh, we as surgeons can do is to help out is if in the event that there will be a scenario where radiation may be given in the, in the post-operative setting, we can leave surgical clips there to help the, the radiation oncologist guide where they're going to radiate that given area. Next. You heard a little bit about this earlier that there's basically there are um, uh, factors that can sort of help determine the risk of local recurrence. Um, these are, include the tumor size, the grade of the tumor, meaning what it looks like under the microscope. So higher grade tumors um, have a higher likelihood of recurring. The histologic subtype, meaning that there's there are at least 50 different subtypes of sarcomas. And so depending upon the subtype, some are more radial, um, more sensitive to radiation than others, and some are also more likely to recur than others. Multifocality, meaning that there's multiple sites of disease. And then also, as you've already just heard about from myself, um, is the margin status. Just as an example, we can, there are ways that we can use the, this information to sort of give general ideas of what the risk of recurrence is or the, or the what we call the disease-free survival might be predicted to be. And so there's there's these charts that we call nomograms that can be used to sort of calculate this based upon all these factors. Next. You saw these guidelines um, presented earlier, um, and so I won't go through them, but basically, and, um, needless to say that, you know, there, it's very clear that for um, extremity and for truncal soft tissue sarcomas, um, that the the guidelines clearly demonstrate or, or indicate a role for radiation therapy in high-risk tumors. 
Next. And also in the uh, case of unplanned resections, and this is a little bit grainy here, but this was the one you saw earlier, the unplanned resections, which often have an R2 or a grossly positive margin, um, are another scenario where um, radiation therapy may be um, indicated. Next. So as you heard, the retroperitoneal sarcomas are a different story. Um, the most common retroperitoneal sarcomas that we often see are the lyomyosarcomas, sarcomas, which are, are sarcomas that arise from smooth muscle cells. Um, I can't really point here, but in that upper left, there's a large dark gray circle on the left side of that patient's abdomen, sort of behind the, that gray area, which is the liver. Um, that's a large lyomyosarcoma. sarcoma. To the right is a liposarcoma, so uh, majority of that area um, involving the right side, the entire, probably 75% of the right side of the picture is all uh, tumor in that case. On the lower left is a, is a patient with neurofibromatosis type 1 and a malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor. This is a large tumor on the left lower side of the abdomen, sort of on the left side of the picture. And on the bottom right is a tumor invading the spine, which is the spine is the bright white bone um, in the back. But Despite the fact that these are obviously heterogeneous tumors and they can occur throughout the um, abdomen um, in the retroperitoneum next. There was randomized data that just published this last uh, year by a um, group from the EORTC, which is the European uh, group called STROSS. And basically what it showed is that there was no benefit to giving radiation therapy in the preoperative setting for patients with retroperitoneal sarcomas. And so therefore, based upon this data, um, that was a randomized trial. We do no longer um, recommend ra routine radiation therapy for patients preoperatively. Next. But there are situations, and we take it on a case by case basis, where if the patient is at very high risk for local recurrence, there are scenarios where we might think about radiating a patient's uh, tumor prior to um, an operation um, and resection of their tumor. Next. So what are the benefits to preoperative radiation from the surgical perspective? Well, you know, it decreases the total amount of radiation that's given. The course is a little bit shorter. The fields may be a little bit smaller, and so therefore less uh, late toxicity from the radiation or improved um, function of the extremities, um, meaning moving your arms and legs. Um, the tumor target's clearly defined when it's taken out. Um, you know, clips, as I mentioned, might be one um, approach to target that area, but but the tumor itself can't you know be targeted once it's removed. Um, in addition, delivery um, is not impacted by postoperative wound healing issues or complications, meaning that if somebody has a problem healing their incisions from surgery or has a complication after surgery and this delays their subsequent care, this may delay their time to get radiation therapy after the operation. The other benefit is that potentially that. It, Radiation therapy before an operation may actually decrease the size of the tumor and make the, the operation easier or improve limb salvage. Um, in addition, it may also select the patients that develop metastatic disease and therefore um, um, avoid an unnecessary operation. And finally, it may have a less impact on, uh, on um, um, worsening quality of life. Next. So what about the benefits of post-operative radiation from a surgical perspective? Well, uh, in the situation of um, definitive pathologic assessment can be um, obtained, especially when the pathology is not um, is un unclear um, um, grade or there's other questions about the pathology. In those situations, we may not have the opportunity to give radiation therapy if we don't have a clear indication at that time. Um, in addition, um, there are lower rates of uh, post-operative wound healing complications if the radiation therapy is given after the wound has healed. Next. Just a couple of other considerations in personalizing um, therapy after surgery would be those situations of giving radiation therapy um, for close or um, microscopically positive margins on bones or blood vessels or nerves where we can't just go back and re-resect or a reoperation if there's a grossly positive margin um, from resection um, followed by a re-resection that may have significant impact on functionality. 
And so a scenario where we might have to, it might be crossing a joint or something along those lines where the patient may have significant loss of function, this may be um, a, um, another indication. Um, next. So in summary, I think what you can see here is, is that really sarcoma care is, is truly personalized. It's critical that you have a team of physicians um, working around the patient from all aspects of surgical to medical to radiation, oncology to diagnostic and interventional radiology as pathology. And the benefit of being at a sarcoma center um, as designated by the Sarcoma Foundation of America is, is the fact that you have high volume centers with experts that see these patients, that know how to discuss these patients, that have access to clinical trials and work with patient advocate groups in order to um, provide the best care for their patients. And so with that, um, I'll finish and say thank you very much for the opportunity to present today. Good afternoon, good evening, everybody. My name is John Trent. I am a, a sarcoma medical oncologist at the Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center in Miami. This is uh, my contact information. If you want, we're not gonna have much time today to discuss all of this information, but this is my contact information if you wanna reach me. Could you go to slide number 11? Yep, keep going, keep going. Keep going, keep going. Right, well, back, back, yeah, back. Num right there. Okay, so, oh, go back one slide. Sorry, so we've heard there's 175 different sarcoma types. There's also a number of different chemotherapies that we use for all of these different types of sarcomas. And this is a partial list of most of the agents that are active in some type of sarcoma. Next slide. These are the agents that we give re routinely at the same time as radiation therapy. These agents don't have an additive effect on normal tissue when they're given at the same time as radiation therapy. So sometimes we give radiation therapy and some of these chemotherapies at the same time for a variety of different reasons. Next slide. Um, keep going. Next. Next. Yeah, right here, I just wanted to point out, make a chemotherapy point, is that doxorubicin does interact in a, in a in, in a additive at least way with radiation therapy. So we don't give doxorubicin or gemcitabine at the same time as radiation therapy. When we give these, these are the two most active agents for most, the most common sarcoma types. And this data supports the use of higher doses of chemotherapy. So the dose, it's not just the agent a patient gets, it's the dose. Okay, next slide. Um, I just wanted to point out here that the metastatic pattern or when a sarcoma spreads to different locations, uh, the pattern is different by different type of sarcoma. So the type of screening, whether that's a chest x-ray or an MRI or a PET scan, is very different between the different sarcoma types. Next slide. And then I wanted to point out another, make another point, and that is we do our radiation therapists do give different types of radiation therapy for sarcomas, even when they spread. It's not just the primary tumor that gets treated. There's a lot of data supporting the use of radiation therapy in select patients whose tumor has spread to other organs, such as the lung. Next slide. 
And then this is data supporting the concurrent use of these agents. Next slide. And then the point I made about radio sensitizing, there are certain agents such as doxorubicin and gemcitabine that can, can increase the activity of radiation therapy in the tumor, but can also increase the toxicity in normal tissue. And this would be considered an area of research. Um, radio sensitizing agents are not standard of care in, in sarcoma. Next slide. I think that's really all the points that I had to make. So I'd be happy to thank everybody for attending this, uh, this exciting session with all of these new guidelines in, in soft tissue uh, sarcomas. And I'd like to congratulate the other panelists on great presentations. And I don't know whether we have a few minutes for questions or not. I'll leave that up to the SFA, who I'd also like to think thank Dean and Brandy for putting on this, um, this webinar. Thank you, Dr. Trent. I think we have time for just a couple of questions that we've received. Um, I have one here that says uh, that they, the, the participant has recently read about a high intensity radiation program referred to as GRID being developed in Israel in sarcoma cases. And I was wondering if there's a similar program in the U.S. and how effective it is and what sarcoma patients may be a candidate for that treatment. This is Ashley. Um, thank you for the question. Um, I'm not familiar with that and we are not offering it uh, at MD Anderson. I'll um, maybe see if uh, Dr. Betty has uh, any uh, additional insight into that. Yeah, um, GRID is a specific type of uh, radiation where it, it focuses high dose uh, uh, radiation um, over uh, several spots. So if you look at a radiation uh, field, um, there are there are areas where there'll be high, like very ultra high doses um, on certain areas or certain spots where we think that might be problematic. It's not commonly used. It's more emerging research. I've read a few and I reviewed a few abstracts and um, manuscripts on it, but it's 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 still a very novel technique um, and not ready for prime time yet. It's something we don't use either here at the medical college. Thank you very much. Um, we have one question. Can radiation be given a second time over the original field? And if so, what are the risks? So the short answer is not usually. Um, so sarcomas that have recurred after a course of radiotherapy, uh, depending on the interval to recurrence, obviously, um, are thought to be somewhat radio resistant. Um, and so you cannot give the full dose of radiation a second time. And so if the full dose didn't work the first time, giving less dose in a subsequent course is very unlikely to provide much more than side effects. So in all but very rare and select cases in the uh, over 15 years that I've been on service, the sarcoma service at MD Anderson, we have almost, um, we, we very, very rarely do re-irradiation. Uh, the risks are extremely high of bone and soft tissue breakdown when you re-irradiate. Um, you can also cause nerve damage uh, or critical organ damage in the field because even though the tumor may be, have grown back and the tumor cells themselves are new because they're back, the normal tissues that saw the radiation before remember the radiation and so they can't tolerate very much of it. Thank you. Um, so this kind of, this next question kind of goes to what uh, a couple of you had mentioned, but I'll ask it anyhow, as it may be a little more specific. Um, they're wondering if you can use radiation for a well-differentiated liposarcoma in, retro, in the retroperitoneum. The, so the short answer is yes, you can. Um, and in fact, in uh, the Strauss trial that Dr. Cyclic uh, discussed, uh, there was some um, potential early subgroup analysis evidence that that particular tumor may actually benefit from radiotherapy. 
Uh, again, uh, it was a more of a hypothesis generating finding. Uh, longer follow-up is needed and further analyses of those patients. But uh, in short, yes, it is worth a multidisciplinary discussion for every patient with that diagnosis to discuss whether radiation may be helpful. There's also emerging agents that emerging data on agents such as trabectidin and CDK4 inhibitors such as palbocyclib and their activity against well differentiated tumors. Yeah, I concur with um, all of my panelists here. I think that the most important thing, particularly in, in that subtype, is to have that multidisciplinary and uh, discussion. Um, you know, ask the surgeon, do you feel like this may be beneficial, for also from your perspective, and 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 achieving negative margins. Um, each case is different, but I agree, particularly with that subtype and the data that's shown. It um, definitely is worth a discussion. And I would I would add to that that when they the the data that they found in in the uh, Strauss trial basically was a subset analysis so it wasn't the study wasn't designed to ask that question or to answer that question in the subset analysis yes there was this a signal that there may be um, some improvement in recur local recurrence with the well differentiated liposarcomas. With also with the caveat that it was only the smaller lipos liposarcoma, so again a subset of a subset that potentially had the benefit. So it was it was tumors less than 15 centimeters, where there could be a discussion about whether there's a role for that in that given patient. We have a question for Dr. Cyclic um, for sarcoma. Do you find that there is any preference over robotic versus open with the surgery? So, um, in terms of extremity surgery, it's there's no the robotic surgery is really um, used these days for abdominal and thoracic surgery. Um, for so for extremities, that's obviously puts that off the um, the table. For abdominal and retroperitoneal tumors, especially most of these tumors are very big, as you could see from most of those um, pictures I showed you. It's it's fairly common to see larger tumors. Um, trying to take out a 20 pound tumor through an incision that's five millimeters or you know or or 10 millimeters is impossible and so generally for those kind of scenarios it's really not there's not a role for robotic surgery um, robotics basically just being an offshoot of laparoscopic surgery or sort of keyhole surgery but there are scenarios um, where a tumor may be amenable if it's small enough to doing that but but for the majority of, of, especially of the larger liposarcomas and liomyosarcomas that are involving blood vessels, et cetera, it's not always technically feasible nor safe. Um, and I think I, we'll, we'll do one more. Um, the, the participant was told that preoperative radiation could cause difficulties during surgery. Um, can you speak to this at all? Uh, I mean, it doesn't cause difficulties per se. I mean, it can definitely, uh, the tissue planes when you're dissecting can be um, different than, than tissue planes that have not been radiated. Um, sometimes in some, if, if the radiation has been done and we generally operate about six weeks or so after the radiation is completed, there's actually tissue edema there. So it actually helps sort of separate the planes a little bit and actually makes the dissection sometimes a little bit easier. If the if things are allowed to go on for longer periods of time, where it's, let's say it's several months later after somebody received radiation, it can sort of lead to some fibrosis or scarring, which then makes it more difficult. So part of it is, so the answer is yes and no, and it, part of it is depending upon timing, um, et cetera. I would add to that. Um, so I think that's, an, that's a very good question. And, 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 and so the recommendation for preoperative versus postoperative radiation therapies, so it's an important to know that the actual local control outcomes and, uh, are the same, whether you do pre-op versus post-op. What are different are the side effects. So when you do preoperative radiotherapy, uh, the question asker is correct that the risk of a wound complication after surgery is higher than for postoperative radiation therapy. However, generally wound complications, while non-trivial, are temporary. They usually can be managed and then they resolve. When you do post-operative radiotherapy, the dose is higher, the field tends to be bigger, and that can lead to more fibrosis, 
swelling of the limb and functional problems and those side effects are permanent once they set in they often don't go away thus we recommended when possible preoperative radiation therapy if the surgeon agrees over postoperative radiation therapy great points thank you very much and with that uh, we'll need to wrap up our session uh, thank you again to drs betty guadanalo uh, Cyclic and Trent for taking the time to be with us today and sharing your thoughts and expertise. Uh, we appreciate all that you do for the sarcoma community. And uh, thank you to everyone who tuned in today uh, to be a part of this discussion. As a reminder, today's session uh, was recorded and a link will be posted to SFA's website within the next few days. You can find uh, SFA online at www.curesarcoma.org. Uh, we have also posted information for future ed education sessions on our website. Uh, this now concludes the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.